Yeah, thank you so much for, for being here today. Um, yeah, my name's Chris. I'm going to talk to you about solving healthcare problems with search. So yeah, a little intro about myself. I'm Chief Customer Officer at a company called Travel Time. Um, I'm responsible for customer success, making sure both our sort of businesses and general users get as much value out of our tools as possible. Um, I began on the product side of the business, but I'm not a developer, so probably a less technical talk than some of the other ones we've had today and yesterday, but hopefully some interesting stories to tell you guys. So who are Travel Time? So we're an API first company, so we build APIs as a product. We don't build end-to-end -end solutions. We're not building SaaS. Um, just an API as a building block that our customers then use in their own applications. Specifically, we build high-performance mobility APIs, and we'll get into what that means in a bit. We went live in 2014, and there's now 45 of us, um, headquarters in London, but spread out across, across Europe. So just a quick agenda. We'll talk about a new healthcare search problem that we encountered in 2020. Yeah, no prizes for guessing what healthcare event that was involved with. We'll then walk through how we built a, a search solution to try and address some of those problems. And then we'll kind of bring it up to date and look at how that can be used um, in 2023. So starting out with the, the problem. So yeah, I hope you don't mind me taking you back to summer 2020. Um, COVID is obviously kind of kicking off. And yeah, one of the biggest initial sort of responses was getting people tested. So this is kind of before the vaccine rollout, getting people to go and get tests to stop positive people um, continuing and transmitting, transmitting the disease. And yeah, there were some pretty ambitious targets for getting people tested. Um, this is in the UK. The government set a target of yeah, 500,000 tests per day. And this is in-person testing, so not kind of lateral flows that you do at home, but tests that you actually have to go, go to in person. And so when you were trying to get a test, you would go into the sort of web application, fill out some details, and you would then get recommended a test for you to go and get. And so a, a big part of this question is, how do you match people to the best available test for them? Um, obviously, factors around you know, the right sort of test being available um, on the right day and the right time. But a big part of this is also, how do you use the locations of available tests um, and the location of the user to match people to the appropriate tests? And this was particularly a big problem initially when kind of testing infrastructure was still coming up to speed and demand for tests outstripping supply. With fewer tests available, getting this matching of people to the locations of available tests wrong can have kind of real, real, real world issues. So initially, this, this matching of users to tests was done using a simple kind of straight line distance. Um, some obvious reasons for this. A, easy to implement. Um, these teams were obviously working to incredibly tight deadlines getting these solutions live. So it kind of makes sense to start with a simple to implement um, straight line search. And also, it's, it's fast in terms of the performance at, at query time. So matching people to locations, using a straight line distance, kind of easy to implement and, and fast. But it has some kind of fairly obvious issues. Um, these were both real world issues that were kind of flagged to us of people being sent to get a test in a location that just wasn't appropriate. So on the left hand side, we have the Isle of Wight, which is an island off the south coast of England people being sent to a test in Portsmouth because that was the nearest available test 
based on a straight line distance search. But to get there, you have to get a ferry. Probably not great when we're all being told to stay at home, um, not travel if we, unless we have to. So people being sent to get a test that involves getting a ferry, or even worse, on the right-hand side, crossing from, from Northern Ireland to Scotland, um, yeah, not, not a good solution. So what is the problem here? Well, the problem is that the relevancy of the results provided by this straight line distance approach is just, just not good enough. Um, and this means two things. It might mean people don't go and get their test. So if you're sent to a test location that involves getting a ferry, maybe you just won't go and get the test. Or people will go and get the tests, but they'll have to travel further than um, we want them to, with obviously the risk of transmitting the disease, et cetera. And what's the solution to this? So we need to find a better way of matching people to available tests. And there are various different options for this. So rather than the straight line distance approach, we could do a bounding box. So a bounding box, a pretty simple idea, um, a rectangle marked by the coordinates of the top left corner and the bottom right corner, normally used when you're kind of searching on an interactive map. You can drag the, the map around. The bounding box is the, the screen, um, and the search will kind of update in, in real time. It's a very simple calculation, so it can be done, done very fast but it doesn't really solve the issue in, in most cases. If we go back to our, our Isle of Wight example, if we used this bounding box to, to filter the available um, test locations, people are still going to be matched with um, locations across the, the water that we don't want them to be traveling to. So we could use a, a static polygon. So a static polygon normally used to represent like um, a geographic area, so in this case, Berlin, but it could be yeah, a, a borough or a municipality. And yeah, we could use this polygon to filter um, available testing locations. But again, it's not really solving the problem a lot of the time. Um, if I was down in the, in the southeast corner of Berlin, and we used this polygon to filter the available tests for me, I might be sent to one on the other side of the city, while there might be a more suitable one you know, just outside of this polygon. So it's still not solving the fundamental problem that I'm going to have to go to this test. Therefore, we need to search using kind of the transport available to me. So this is kind of the only solution, is to search using the physical environment. So taking into account how that person will have to travel from where they are to where they're going to have this test done. So what does this look like in reality? So we could use a different kind of polygon. Um, we could use a polygon showing where someone can get to using the transport networks available to them in a certain amount of time and then use that polygon to filter, filter the results. And this is not a, not a new idea. So this is a map from 1914 showing how far you could get in, in number of days from London. So yeah, it might be a little, little hard to read, but it goes from five days, the red area, all the way up to over 40 days. And yeah, this is called an isochronic map. Um, an isochrone is a, a fancy word for basically points that are the same amount of time away from a, a central location. And yeah, hopefully it's, it's reasonably clear, but these are not circles. You can't move um, at the same speed in all directions. You're at the mercy of, yeah, the transport networks available. So you can get to the west coast of Australia faster than you can get to the, the middle of Africa. And so if we were using these to filter which test location are we going to send someone to, maybe we would want to send someone to 
you know, the west coast of Australia rather than Central Africa. So what does this look like going back to our, our Isle of Wight example? So this is a, a one hour driving isochrone using um, the isochrone endpoint of our, of our API. And yeah, it seems to come, be kind of producing a better result. So if we use this polygon to filter the available results, someone wouldn't be sent across the water to go and get their test. They would be kept on the island that they can reach without having to get the ferry. If we look at the other side of the water, again, someone searching um, in Portsmouth wouldn't be sent to the Isle of Wight. However, this only really gives us kind of one extra data point. It tells us, is a test within an hour's drive or not? It has no way of distinguishing between those tests. So in this example, we'd much rather someone drove to a test that's five minutes away rather than 55 minutes away. But if we were just using this one hour polygon to do the, to do the filtering, we wouldn't have any way of distinguishing between the two. So it's not actually improving our relevancy that much. It's giving us kind of one extra data point, but yeah, it's still not able to distinguish well enough between the different um, options. It also has the, the problem of being just too slow. So if we were going to implement this kind of driving isochrone approach, whenever someone went and searched for a test, we'd have to generate the polygon, use the polygon to then do a sort of in-out filter on the, on the test locations. And this is just going to slow down um, the performance of the search. And kind of important to, to note that the as-is situation is a straight line distance search, obviously incredibly fast. So using this polygon approach would have a kind of too big an impact on, on performance without much relevancy improvement. So having kind of discounted all of these options, the, the testing teams put together yeah, a series of requirements for what they needed this, this search to do. So first of all, they needed to search based on the driving time from the user to each available test location. Obviously using driving because public transport wasn't really available in the pandemic. And they basically wanted to use this data to recommend the closest driving closest test in terms of driving time to each user, minimizing the time they'd spend um, traveling to get their test. It had to be able to handle thousands of test locations in each search um, and potentially a completely different list of testing locations each time. Um, it was not a static list of locations, new testing centers coming online the whole time, others closing down, so potentially each search had a completely new list to, to search. They had very, very high performance requirements, so returning results in under 50 milliseconds. We know from kind of countless studies in the world of e-commerce that you know, any, any degradation in the, the response when you run a search leads to lower um, conversions. And in this case, you know, we're not trying to get people to, to buy things but we're still trying to get them to complete an action, in this case, booking a test. So if we're slowing down the results that they see, fewer people will end up completing and, and booking a test. It also had to be able to cope with extremely high demand, um, potentially up to 100,000 people searching for a test at the same time. Um, there were, yeah, peaks, particularly when like, new restrictions were introduced or relaxed or um, tests rolled out to new demographics. And when these, were, yeah, when these were released, there were huge spikes in demand for, for a test. It had to be pretty bulletproof in terms of uptime. Um, they obviously had kind of failovers to go back to straight line distance, but wanted to avoid this at all costs. One you maybe wouldn't think of, but user data privacy was incredibly important. Um, when, you were when you were booking a test, you obviously put in lots of personal information, name, all of this kind of thing. And yeah, it was expected that 
the majority of the population would use this system at some point. So, yeah, there couldn't be any risk to kind of having that personal information accessible. And they were moving pretty quickly. Um, once these kind of straight line distance search issues became apparent, there was a lot of pressure to, yeah, to get them solved as quickly as possible. But they also had a, a kind of an understanding that the goalposts were constantly changing, and therefore they needed a, yeah, a solution that could be flexible when, when things changed, often, often overnight. So yeah, these were, these were their requirements. Um, and we were kind of sent these requirements from the testing team. And there was definitely a feeling of like, this, you know, this is pretty ambitious. This, we don't know if this is at all doable, but here you go. Luckily, this is exactly what we specialize in. Um, not a healthcare search solution, but the ability to run high performance, time-based searches um, at incredibly high performance, et cetera. So what I'm going to do now is just take each of those requirements and yeah, walk through kind of how we built a solution to, to meet each of them. So at the most fundamental level, to be able to search by time or by drive time, you need to be able to calculate drive times. Um, and you can't cheat this. You can't just take a straight line distance to each test location and do a sort of speed equals distance over time. So we built a driving model that can predict the driving speed along any road in a, dro in a, in a road network. Um, it takes a whole load of data sets in terms of the type of road, the, the surrounding area, um, physical features of the road, aspects of the network itself, and yeah, predicts drive times. We then yeah, do some very clever maths of building a graph of nodes um, in the road network, and then the edges represent the, um, the driving times between each node. And then traversing that graph allows us to calculate drive times to, yeah, between any locations on the network. And yeah, this is a kind of patented piece of technology that yeah, sits underneath a lot, of, a lot of what we do. So we then need to be able to accept requests with huge numbers of points. So we built an endpoint in the API that can take 100,000 locations at once. Um, what it does is it takes the, the lat long coordinates of the user, it takes the lat long coordinates of all of the testing locations, it has a transport mode, in this case, always driving, and a time of day. And what it sends back is a big long list of the driving time to each of these lat long coordinates also returns the true distance. And this is the benefit of it being through an API. Like we don't care what that list of lat long coordinates is. Um, as new testing centers come online, they just send the latest list in each search. We send back the travel times. So there's no need for us to kind of mirror um, or constantly updating a list on our side. To return results in, in under 50 milliseconds, there's obviously some kind of yeah, secret sauce around how we, how we do this so fast. Um, but when we got down to trying to shave off the final bits of, um, bits of time, we actually moved away from the original endpoint, which is a, a JSON endpoint, to using protobuf, or protocol buffers. A um, couple of reasons for this. The binary is faster to serialize and, and deserialize than the JSON. And yeah, the binary messages are smaller, so less, le less network latency. Um, and when you're trying to shave off you know, milliseconds here and there, this actually was kind of the final, the final win that got us to the performance requirements. So four and five, able to coach with, cope with huge numbers of concurrent searches with sort of bulletproof SLA. This is where the, the infrastructure kind of kicks in. Um, so we had an, a dedicated environment for them um, on dedicated servers. Everything we do is dedicated servers, um, not, not cloud servers. 
and then just redundancy, redundancy, redundancy. So I think in the end we had six instances running um, with a load balancer over the top and a failover load balancer. You could you know, take a shotgun to five of those instances and the service would, would still be up. And we were just sort of cautious to the point of paranoia about mixing both data center providers. So if there was a, a networking issue that took down a whole provider, we would still be unaffected. Um, and also geographic locations. So you know, if there was a power cut that took out the whole of London, having servers in other locations, that means the service still stays up. In terms of the user, user data privacy requirement, um, kind of two, two parts to this. Firstly, the request that we get doesn't actually have any personally identifiable um, data in it. It's just a list of lat long coordinates, um, a type of transport, and a time of day. So in the first case, we're not receiving any of that personal information from the, from the user. Secondly, the calculations themselves are all done in memory. Um, we don't write any of this information to disk. The only things we store are like data for performance monitoring. So yeah, kind of ticking all the boxes from a, a user data privacy requirements. In terms of getting a bespoke solution um, live on a tight deadline, a little game of spot the difference. On the left-hand side is what it originally looked like. On the right-hand side is the solution that they went with in the end. The difference being, so this is, this is showing isochrones um, just because it's easier to visualize, but it's the same principle for the, 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 the search itself. Originally, the model allowed um, journeys that took car ferries, and therefore these kind of disconnected islands were included in the results. Um, they, yeah, they came up with a requirement that actually they really didn't want people taking these ferries for obvious reasons. So yeah, we were able to kind of rerun the models, strip those ferries out, and get them the results that, that they needed. And yeah, kind of piecing all of that together, once it went live, a huge amount of testing and all this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, every time someone searched for a COVID test in the UK, uh, the travel time API was used to match that user to their closest available test using um, how long it would take them to drive there. Now, obviously, this is no longer live, so I can't show you it in action. But what I can show you is uh, a customer of ours who um, yeah, runs a, a travel time search not for a test, but for a job. So this is Total Jobs. You can go and search for a job based on a location and you can set a maximum travel time. And when they hit search, this will send a live request to our API. We will send back the driving times for every matching, um, matching job. And this is, yeah, this is not cached. This is all live calls. And you can see there's a, a driving time attached to each of those results. And it's, yeah, it's fast enough to be used in the relevancy sorting of which jobs are shown, shown first. So searching for jobs rather than tests, but exactly the same technology. We also had other, other bits um, using this technology in COVID itself. Um, yeah, more around the kind of planning um, of testing and then subsequently um, vaccine centers. So kind of getting ahead of the point of someone searching and making sure that when they did search, there would be sufficient coverage for them to go and get a test or a, um, or a vaccine. So yeah, bring things up to date uh, to 2023. So yeah, the, the benefit of this being, of us being kind of API first is we didn't build a custom application for the COVID testing. We built an endpoint of the API, but it's completely agnostic to what those locations are. Um, and so it can be used for searching anything. So it now gets used in the UK. We have a service called 111, which is for um, non-emergency medical requirements. You can call them up. The, the system that their um, call operators now use uses the same travel time API to find the nearest medical facilities for that user based on how long it's going to take them to get there. 
Similarly, it now gets used for 999, which is medical emergencies. Um, again, when you call them up, the call operators use a, a system that uses our API to um, search for available ambulances and match the closest one to that emergency based on how long it's going to take them to get there, not just how far it is in terms of straight line distance. But there are obviously some use cases that have additional requirements. So up until this point, we've only been talking about driving because the COVID solution was built purely using driving. But obviously, that's not the only way people navigate the world. And for, particularly for public transport, the, the difference between searching by time and distance becomes even more pronounced. So here we have a, a five-mile search in, in London. We can compare that to what it looks like um, by time for driving. But when we start looking um, at public transport, you can see that the reachable shape is very different to a circle. Um, we could look at mainline trains. So these little circles are, are probably train stations that you can get to on a, a fast train and then continue um, on foot. But you can't get off the train when it doesn't stop. So they're not connected to, to the rest of the shape. And what this means is, if you're searching by distance instead of by, by time, there are kind of two problems. First of all, you're potentially returning results that are not relevant to that user. So if they can't get to that location, then it's not a good result to show them. On the flip side, you're also missing opportunities that maybe they could get to, but because you're doing a distance search, you're, you're not including them in the results that you show. I'm just going to run through kind of some of the some of the extra challenges that we face to build this search for other modes of transport. So, if you've ever spent any time with public transport data, you'll recognise this as um, GTFS data. This is kind of the data structure of public transport timetables. So, yeah, to enable this searching by time for public transport, we have to hoover up and consolidate huge amounts of this public transport timetable data to build a model that can navigate the world using public transport. And public transport is much less static than driving data. So how far you can drive will change a bit over the course of the day, but not huge amounts. This shows, oh, let's run that again. It's not going to run again, is it? Yeah, it shows how far you can get just over the course of an hour in New York using public transport. And you can imagine how much that changes over the course of a day. So yeah, just a completely different challenge to, to solve um, when using public transport as opposed to just driving. And there's a huge amount of data. So yeah, we now have public transport coverage in, in 92 countries. This, in, this involves getting the data from 15,000 public transport agencies. Um, three and a half million stops, 200,000 routes. And this is not just data you can kind of collect once and then you're good. It needs to be updated. Well, we update ours at least every week to make sure yeah, changes in the timetables are being reflected. And yeah, as part of this, we've kind of built one of the largest public transport databases in the world. So this shows um, every stop and station that we have with a 15-minute um, a walking area around each of them. Um, yeah, mainly just included this to show how good Germany is in terms of public transport coverage. Other transport modes. So cycling, you have the challenge that you can't cycle as fast uphill as you can cycle downhill. So we had to take into account elevation. Um, so this shows two different searches from the same location. One is a departure search in blue. One is an arrival search, so getting to the yellow star in red. The red one is bigger because this is in Switzerland. You're coming downhill. You can get further in the same amount of time than you can cycling in the other direction when you're going uphill. And we've also built some kind of fully multimodal modes of transport. So this is a, a driving and train model. So it lets you drive to a train station, park your car, and then continue by train. And yeah, won't go into this in too much detail, but you can see that 
the complexity just gets massively higher when you're trying to combine these different transport modes. So yeah, we're now at a point where that search by time capability is available for yeah, walking, cycling, uh, driving, and public transport. And this unlocks some new, yeah, new use cases. So we do a lot of work around like um, workforce planning. So this is a customer of ours who basically matches um, nurses and pharmacists to temporary shifts. And a massive part of this matching is matching people to shifts that they can actually get to in a reasonable travel time. So you'll see on the, the middle image there from their app, there's a, a travel time listed on all of these shifts. And the, yeah, the available shifts are searched based on how long it's going to take someone to get there, not how far away it is in terms of a straight line distance. Another one, this is very similar to the kind of 999 use case, um, a customer who yeah, sends mobile doctors to where they're needed, and again, using the same API to match, um, yeah, match available doctors to locations based on, based on time. And just finally, yeah, the same technology is also used um, for the sort of healthcare planning side of things. So in, kind of in a similar way to um, in the, the COVID era being used to locate testing centers and vaccine centers, things like planning where to have GP surgeries. So again, making sure that you're kind of modeling coverage of population using times rather than circles and, and straight line distances. And yeah, it can be done at a, a national level. So this was a piece done by the New York Times looking at yeah, where people have access to emergency rooms across the US. And yeah, doing it by time instead of distance just gets yeah, much more relevant results. So yeah, just to, just to kind of wrap up, um, COVID I think shone a light on the importance of search relevancy when it comes to healthcare because yeah, most healthcare involves people moving around, people going to get a test, doctors going to see patients, people going to hospitals. Um, and when people are searching, searching by time gives a more relevant search, um, better matching of people to locations, and therefore better outcomes. Um, and yeah, this wasn't something we set out to do. We didn't set out to build a healthcare solution, but yeah, we found that the travel time solutions that we build are very relevant in this, in this space. And yeah, in terms of what's next, we're, yeah, we're deploying this kind of ultra-fast search to over 100 countries at the moment, um, because yeah, these healthcare challenges are not specific to the UK, they kind of yeah, apply everywhere. So yeah, we're hoping that with this technology, we'll see a lot more time-based searching done in healthcare um, yeah, around the world. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Chris, for your uh, wonderful talk. Has anybody got a question for Chris with regards to saving lives? Thank you very much for the great talk. Um, I have a question. Uh, which kind of offline pre-calculations uh, pre are you doing? What kind of offline pre... Yeah, so there is a, a mix of pre-calculation, but most of it is done at query time. Um, so it's not a load of just pre-calculated stuff in a lookup table. Um, yeah, the, the models are running in real time and are just able to yeah, traverse that graph fast enough to calculate the travel times at the point of search. Anybody else? Uh, hi, thank you for the presentation. My question is, uh, do you consider some feedback loops or is just uh, what you ask is what you get and you're building your models by, uh, with no feedback from, from the users? Uh, we get tons of feedback from users. <laughs> um, we actually have a, we built a kind of demo app that, yeah, we initially built to kind of show what the API could do, but it's just become a sort of 
well, we're a B2B business, but this is a sort of consumer-facing app that is free to use. And yeah, it's, it's super useful because it, when people use it, they can yeah, leave feedback on how realistic they think the results that they're seeing are. Um, yeah, and we feed that back into, into what we're doing, absolutely. Anybody? In the back. Um, is your application able to um, consider events like an accident on which a main road is blocked or anything else which might influence the paths uh, your customers want to take? Yeah, great question. Um, we don't incorporate like live traffic data. So yeah, we update everything every week. So when new roads become open or roads close for a, a long period of time, they get reflected. But a lot of what we're doing is, you know, when you're searching for something, you won't necessarily be taking the journey straight away. So if you're booking a COVID test, you might be booking it for two days time. You don't really want the fact that there's an accident on the road today to impact the results that will be applied when you actually make that journey. Um, so yeah, we don't take into account live, live traffic data. Thank you.